Welcome back to Constitutional Live with David Barton and Rick Green. It's time to get into the specifics. We're going to go through those specific enumerated powers in Article 1, Section 8, those powers given to Congress. But David, before we get to the specifics back in Philly and walk through them, when you think about the specifics and you think about all that you've learned from reading the Founding Fathers and their intent for these clauses in the Constitution, what's one that comes to mind that's really been changed from what they intended, distorted, even abused? I think there's one that's abused by our folks that, that are pro-Constitution people and they confuse a small government with a limited government and there's a big difference between the two. Yeah. Uh, a limited government is what the Constitution established and so when you think of a limited government, quite frankly a limited government means it has certain jurisdictions, it's got certain lines it has to stay within. It, it doesn't have to do with the size, it has to do with what it can and can't do. So it could be a lot of money or it could be a, a big department, That's right. but it's within a certain jurisdictional line. That's right. So if you look within the Constitution, the Constitution authorizes a military now, if you're going to have a military that will defend 330 million Americans it's going here to have to be big. and abroad, it's not going to be small. Yeah. It's, a, it's a limited government because it's limited to that military, but it's not a small area. The same, the, the Constitution says that the president can appoint ambassadors, can make treaties with foreign nations. That's why we have a State Department. That's one of the four original cabinet level departments the Founding Fathers knew we needed. We've got 257 embassies across the world. In the United States, we're one of 195 nations, and that goes up and down every year at the UN, but 257 embassies, that's not small. And that's not a small so budget. So your State either. Department's going to be big, but it still it hasn't crossed over those jurisdictional lines. It's still it's limited still within to the it. things we defined. Post Office. Article 1, Section 8 says that Congress will establish post offices and post roads. We got 31,000 post offices because yeah. we have one in every community. That's not small, yeah. but it's limited. So that's limited government. And, and if we make the mistake of confusing limited government with small government, you get really frustrated and you won't understand it. Limited government means, hey, there are a certain set of lines you cannot cross. And those jurisdictional lines, and, and I'll give you a way this, this used to work because we've already talked in previous programs about the six principles of the Declaration, yeah. one of which involved inalienable rights and moral laws. And one of the moral laws that we had dealt with the issue of marriage. Now, th this is really easy to understand. Jesus has a quote out of Matthew 22, 21. He says, render to Caesar that which is Caesar, to God that which is God's. In other words, there are certain jurisdictions. This is not a separation church and state verse. There's certain, th we talked earlier that, you know, you've got a gray Dodge pickup. I've got a red Ford pickup. I want yours to be a red, so I go pay. I can't do that. I, I can do that which belongs to me. I can't do that which belongs to you. There are certain areas of authority. Certain areas yeah, yeah. of jurisdictional lines, and Caesar can't be a god. It, it can't get in. So Caesar's got to recognize those lines. Yeah. And so what's with that? A good example of that is the marriage issue. Because if you take the marriage issue itself, back in Genesis 1 through 3, when God created everything, he said, this is good, this is good. But he got to man and woman and a family. He said, this is very good. And then Jesus has the same opportunity with his disciples. And they were asking about divorce, and specifically no-fault divorce, which is what the law allowed. Then he said, hey guys, don't you remember how it was back at the beginning? He said, don't you remember that there was one man, one woman, and that's what God put together. And he said, what God's put together, let not man divide asunder. And so Jesus in that passage in Matthew 19 reaffirms that marriage is a lifelong union of a man and a woman. Okay, so that's God's definition. That is part of the moral law. That was actually part, part of the common law and the Seventh Amendment of the Constitution. This is enshrined in, in the Constitution through, through the common law. So you have that. Now what happens is in previous generations, government would never even think about redefining marriage because that's not part of its jurisdiction. It's already defined. God's already done that. There is something higher than government. That is God. And, so, and so, so government, it's not the government wouldn't have anything to do with marriage. It's their job to uphold it. Their job to uphold it. But it would be outside. They'd be getting across those limited government jurisdictional mm -hmm. lines if they started tinkering with it and changing the definition to be something it wasn't. Let me take you to a court case that happened on this. 1913. The case is called Grigsby versus Reeve. Actually, this is the Supreme Court of Texas, and the question was, can we have civil unions? In other words, there are, there's religious weddings or God weddings. Can we have secular weddings as well? Can, can we do a secular? I mean, you, religious people do what you want to do, but we secular people. Here's, here's what the court said, and, and real clear. They said marriage was not originated by human law. This is not something we came up with, therefore we don't have the right to regulate it. It says when God created Eve, she is a wife to Adam. They then and there occupied the status of husband to wife and wife to husband. It says the truth is that civil government has grown out of marriage, which created homes and population and society from which government became necessary. 
Marriages will produce a home and a family that will contribute to good society, to free and just government, and the support of Christianity. They said it would be sacrilegious to apply the designation a civil contract to such a marriage. It's that and more to status ordained by God. Now, this is a statement of jurisdiction. We can't go to find that. It doesn't belong to us. I, I can't go paint your pickup red. It's not mine. Government says, hey, these are areas we can't get into. There's a higher authority here, and we recognize that as the laws of nature and nature's God, and we can't redefine the laws of nature and nature's God. That's limited government. Yeah. That's yeah. a government that says, you know, I recognize there's certain lines I can't cross, and that's why, again, the first premise of the Declaration is there is a creator. If there's nothing higher than government, then government thinks it's God, and it will redefine anything it wants hey, to. Let me, let me ask you a quick question. If you back up there, okay, so marriages will produce a home and family that will contribute to good society, to free and just government, and the support of Christianity. So that tells me then that, that marriage is something that government should be interested in because it's going to benefit the, it promotes, the nation. It, it promotes it. And, and see right. what it said about it will contribute to good society? Among other things I've done, I've been a consultant in the U.S. Justice Department. And we know, for example, that when you look specifically at all violent crime committed in America between 1973 and 1995, 90% of that violent crime came from kids who were raised in a home without a father and a mother. Yeah. So, all right, how much money do we spend on violent crime from that period, those 22 years, and, and how much did it hurt other people? You didn't have a good right. society because people are being You not only have the cost, you have the injuries and the loss of life and yeah. the loss of property that came from it. Plus, we know that the same group of kids raised in, in a situation without a mother and a father, that they're about five times more likely to have educational problems, about four times more likely to have psychological problems, about three times more likely to have health problems. So if we want to keep the cost of health care down, we need to have strong families. See, government could look at this from a totally secular viewpoint and say, and this, this is, is in thing. our best interest yeah. and what we're going to do. And so we've, we've reached a point now where that as you look at out-of-wedlock births, for example, single parent uh, out-of-wedlock births, we have one program alone in America that spends $26.5 billion every year just to help teenagers who are still in high school but have babies while they're in high school, and we're having to pay for that. There's a number of nations across the world that have adopted homosexual or same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. And what we see from those nations over in Europe that have now had it for much longer than America has, uh, they found that the average homosexual marriage lasted 18 months, and in that 18 months, it involved nine extramarital partners. Wow. So if you're in one of those countries and you look at that and say, that's marriage? That doesn't mean much. So what they have found is in those countries, out of wedlock births have increased over 60%. So now they're paying a huge social economic it's cost. It's affecting society. Because and, yeah. it's affecting good society and free and just government because now, since you can't control yourself anymore, you're not raised in an environment where you've been taught to control yourself, we have to control you with more police and more regulations yeah. and more laws and more... So people, we as a society have an interest in this. We this have is, an interest. This is not a... Because you know, sometimes I'll hear people say, well, government just should stay out of it completely, but we can't because you government can. has an interest and does have a jurisdiction in promoting and, and, and supporting see, marriage as defined by and God. And that's part of the wrong argument. Government should get involved in moral issues. I'm sorry, point number four in the Declaration says there's a law of nature and nature's God. Yeah. That is a fixed moral law. That's what we incorporate in the Seventh Amendment of the Constitution. There are fixed moral laws. We do tell you what's right well, and wrong. And every law you pass has a moral aspect to it. it. Does. Somebody's deciding, right, your representatives are deciding from a moral point of view to do something or not do something, to outlaw something like or speed make limits. something legal. Yeah. Every time we, we, we pass a speed limit law that says we think it is moral to drive 55 or below, we think it's immoral to drive 55. Every law establishes yeah. a right and wrong. And John Witherspoon, sign of the Declaration, says every law establishes a moral standard because yeah. we've said it's right or it's wrong. If it's wrong, we're going to punish you for it. That's that's morality. That's legislative morality. That, that's legislative no, no morality. Matter which way. Okay, I got you off track. Sorry about that, but, but no, that's the first that, time that it hit me about that in terms of it. there is a government role here. There is and a here's government a great, role. A great way of looking at it because it affects society. And it, it does affect it. Now, so. one of the interesting things is when you understand limited government, as um, as, as you're going to talk about even in this session coming up. There's ways that that has been expanded, and one of those is through the general welfare yeah, clause. Yeah, talk about an abused clause from the Constitution. Yeah, We can claim anything is for your general welfare. We right. in the government have decided that you need to have red hair, whatever. And yeah. so government can claim general welfare as whatever they want to do for anybody. Right, it's, o it's opened it up to anything. You hear congressmen all the time say, well, the general welfare clause gives us authority to do this, and this is for the general welfare of the nation. But is that what these guys, when we go back to the original intent of the folks who gave well, us the Constitution, how did they mean it? Even go back to recent debates in, in American history, debates over are there companies that are too big to fail? Yeah. Should, should 
federal government bail out companies that are too big to fail because it's going to destroy the economy and that's going to hurt everybody and the general welfare of everybody is you don't want the economy going under. And, and so all this is going, we had the, the TARP bills and the stimulus bills and all these things that have happened. And interestingly, as we sit here in this library, this is a very actively used library. We yeah, this is not a, a museum type thing where all this stuff just right. sits here. You guys are always researching and writing new books and taking information, putting it online. And for we, folks. we have people come through all the time. It is a museum of sorts, but it's a working library. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a working museum. And, and so I remember very distinctly in the middle of that TARP stimulus bailout kind of stuff as we were looking, oh, oh my gosh, uh, insurance is about to go under, real estate's about to go under, the automotive industry is about to go under, banking's about to go under. We've got to bail them out because if they go under, it'll destroy all the jobs in America. And I got a call from three congressmen who were on the floor in the House during that extended debate. And I could hear the debate going in the background. They said, hey, you know, with all the stuff you've got, do you think the Founding Fathers had a position on whether the federal government should bail out private industries and whether there are private industries that are too big to fail? Did they connect that dot from one company to the general welfare of the whole That's nation, right. really, is what they're asking. And, and that is because we're being told in Congress right now, as we debate right now, that this is for the general welfare, yeah. and this is what the founders would want. And, and so, I, I don't know. I went back and actually found in this book right here. Now, this is LH Debates on the Constitution. This is a five-volume set. This is the first ever publication of all the notes at the Constitutional Convention. So a lot of people kept notes. You had Yates and you had King and other folks who kept notes. Uh, Luther Martin, all these delegates kept notes. They're all here. Madison, this is the first time Madison's notes when they come out. So and, and looking through here to see what they did, it turns out that in, in volume... In fact, all those names you just named, you never hear those names. Never hear those. Uh, Madison's are the only ones the that anybody one. talks about, so you had a lot of them. And there's a bunch of them, and, yeah. and they're here. This is volume four of, of those volumes, and in this one, this is done um, and includes some of the later congressional debates that dealt with constitutional issues. And in the back of the book here is in, in volume four. They Hang on, let me ask you this. So, the, so what you're saying is these are the notes that the people that were actually debating the Constitution and adopting the Constitution made and then added to that a lot of the same guys that were in that first Congress that are now debating That's things right. that have to do with the Constitution, they added that because it's helping us understand, now we understand how the Constitution is That's supposed right. to work. Okay, and, sorry, and so what, what you happen is in, in 1792, you have uh, what's called the Codfish Bill. Now, here is the logic in 1792. You have Massachusetts. That is an economic engine that drives America. So much population out of Ma Massachusetts, and, and you had Boston and, and Philadelphia and New York with your three big economic drive engines. Well, the really big one is Massachusetts, and what drives Massachusetts is the fishing industry. What drives the fishing industry is the codfish industry. And to this day, if you go in the Massachusetts chambers, their legislature, there's a big codfish hanging up there in, in the chambers because that was their economic backbone. Yeah. So there was a blight, if you will, on the codfish. Something was killing codfish, and they weren't able to get it's like kind of like when a red tide comes in and wipes yeah. everything. Out. And so here the economy of, of Massachusetts is headed down. Because if they were hurt, if, if they, they were, were the main hurt, economic engine, it's hurt everybody else. And yeah. that means that all these shipbuilders in South Carolina that build ships for, for Massachusetts, if it's there's no coffee, it's going to affect a lot of people. And, and, and so you look at all this stuff that's happened, and so Congress needs to step in. This is a general welfare. This company is too big to fail. This, this is, this is the, that, the AIG and the, and the auto exactly and, the, and all the other folks. This is that, GM of, of whatever these. year this was. Yeah. And, and so all, all that's going on. And so that's, that's progressing on the floor of, of, of Congress back in 1792. And James Madison, who one of the guys who signed the Constitution, one of the players there, one of the guys who really had a significant impact, he steps up, and it's interesting what he says about the general welfare, because he helped frame that clause in the Constitution. And, and he says, wait a minute, guys. He says, if, if you're going to use the general welfare clause to apply money to anything, he says, if Congress can employ money indefinitely to the general welfare, and if they're the sole and the supreme judges of the general welfare, they may soon take the care of religion into their own hands. Hmm. It says, they might appoint teachers in every state, county, and parish and pay them out of the public treasury. They might even take into their own hands um, the education of children, establishing like manner schools throughout the Union. They might even assume the provision for the poor. They might undertake the regulation of all roads other than post roads. In short, everything from the highest object of state legislation down to the most minute object of police would be thrown under the power of Congress. He says, guys, if we don't stop this now before long, Congress is going to get involved in education. They're going to get involved in the police powers. And the states are the ones that do, you know, it's interesting, even the, the police area. At the time of the Founding Fathers, there were only three felonies that were federal because they were listed in the Constitution. You had piracy and you had treason, et cetera. 
now there's nearly 3,500 federal felonies. So he's not the saying that these powers, things could happen and that that's good. He's saying if we go down this road, guys, this is bad. If we go down this, this road, bad. states are going to have nothing left. Yeah. And the states are supposed to be in charge of education. Soon Congress will be. States are supposed to be the ones to deal with religion. Soon Congress will be dealing with religion. All based so, on all based general, on general welfare, welfare being distorted. And so called these guys back on the floor of Congress said, yep, codfish debate. Been there, done that. We've decided that, that the founders decided that the general welfare clause is never to be interpreted to say something's too big to fail and has to be bailed. We talked in, in the very first session about how that they use general principles that are applicable across time. Yeah. And yeah, they had horses, no internet back then, but guess what? That principle is still as timeless today as it was 200 years Whether ago. Whether it's cod fishing or AIG or Anything any other else. big company. It, it, it works. And so that's why, you know, going into this lesson on Article 1, what Congress can't do, yeah. or Congress can, can do, do yeah. what they can't do is they can't use the General Welfare Clause right. to decide to take money that they collect from the states and give it back out for state functions. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through these different phrases, these different clauses in Article 1, Section 8, and talk about what Congress can or can't do. And, and I still have a hard time believing that we're actually going to get to do this, but we're going to do it in the room where those guys did. Yeah, that's so in right. that very room. And I think about that sometimes where they took the time to go through line by line. They didn't just come in and, you know, one person had a proposal for an entire constitution. Okay, let's just vote it over. No, they went through and looked at every line, every phrase meant something, everything that they put in the constitution. They were taking a close look well, at it. Well, you know, one things. of the things that you, you cover is Franklin's call for prayer at the convention. Yeah. And one of the reasons that happened was you had 13 nations that came to the Constitutional Convention. We, we think of them as states. No, the nations, just like Romania is different from Bulgaria, is different from Switzerland. And when they came in, they all had their own plans. You had the Virginia plan, you had the New York plan, you had the Connecticut plan, you had the New Jersey plan, and guess what? If you're from Georgia, you didn't want the New York plan. And if you're from New York, you, you didn't want the Virginia plan. And, and that was the problem they got into, and that's why it was falling apart, yeah. because they didn't come in with the written constitution. They came in with their own separate agendas, and that's where Franklin says, guys, we got to get God in the middle of this, or this thing will fail. And future generations look back to this as, as an example of the futility of the wisdom of man. He said, we gotta get God in this. So you're exactly right. When they got there, they didn't have mapped out in their mind everything. They, they came with agendas that they had to set aside and they went for the common good. And in doing that, they came up with timeless principles that we still get to use today. Let's go look at them one by one. We're headed back to Philadelphia to walk through Article 1, Section 8 and identify those enumerated powers of Congress. So now that we see the big picture, we see seven articles, we see 27 amendments, let's zoom in to Article 1. Because it's here in Article 1 that we're going to discover the enumerated powers of Congress. What Congress is actually supposed to do. I call it the dues of Congress. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on all these other sections in, in Article 1. You all probably remember all this from, from uh, government in high school. You know, our congressmen serve two-year terms. They've got to be 25. Our senators serve six-year terms. They've got to be 30. You get two from each state. Those basics, we're going we're gonna to leave aside for a moment. I want to touch on one thing before I get to Article 1, Section 8, where those enumerated powers are, and that is the enumeration. I don't even use the word census because I think enumeration is a much better description of what is authorized by the Constitution, what they actually intended. It's at the top of page 6 in your Constitution Made Easy. And it says, the actual enumeration shall be made within three years, and it goes through the description of how they're going to count the people so that they know what the membership in Congress ought to be. And if we go back to that Webster's Dictionary to get inside the minds again of these folks, and what did that word enumeration mean? Webster said, it's an, in the United States, it's an enumeration of the inhabitants of the states taken by the order of Congress to furnish the rule of apportioning the representation among the states and the number of reps to which each state is entitled in the Congress. Also, it's an enumeration of the inhabitants of a state taken by order of its legislature. So what's it about? It's about numbering the people so that we know how many members of Congress Pennsylvania right here gets. How many members of Congress does Texas get? How many members of Congress does California get? All of those things are determined by how many people are in the states. It's that simple. So when you look at the actual language there, what's the one constitutional question that census worker ought to be asking you at the door? How many live there? How many live there? How many people live here? Maybe even more accurate, how many citizens live here? How many people are in the house? Not, do you, you know, how many bathrooms do you have? Do you have trouble taking a shower? I mean, have you seen the questions that are, it's ridiculous. I got on the, on the, on the bad list, I guess, I don't know. I guess because I, I, I have my own business, I got on this list where they were asking, it was about 100 questions. Not the 13 question one that's already too invasive, the 100 question one. 
I mean, they want to know the names of my children. They want to know how much money I made, how, how, how many hours a day I worked, all this stuff. I got so frustrated. I, I said, I'm telling you how many people live in my house. That's it. And, and so this guy was, and, and our census workers are great people. They're Americans that, that just want to help get the th thing right. But this guy, this guy would park outside. We live on, on what I call the, the family compound. All right. We got uncles and aunts and grandparents. We all live together on this. We live out in the country in, in Texas. We got a gate at the front. We got 50 caliber guns. And, <laughs> Well, not really. Anyway, so, it, so, so this guy would wait outside the gate. When one of my uh, you know, relatives would come through the gate to go to their house, he'd sneak through the gate and he'd be waiting on my porch and ask me all these questions. I said, man, I'll pay the fine. Whatever the fine is for not answering all those questions, just tell me where to write the check. Oh, I'm going to tell you how many people live in my house. Anyway, I know I probably just wasted five minutes because nobody else cares about this, but this is a pet peeve issue for me. I just really want them to just do what they're constitutionally supposed to do, not ask all these questions. Just find out how many people live there apportion the, the members of Congress throughout the states and stop getting so busy into everybody's business. So that's the enumeration. It's right there in Article 1, uh, there, Article 1, Section 2, if you ever want to look a little closer into it. But let, let's dive into these, these very specific powers of, of Congress. And, and if you go to the, the end of Article 1, there are three sections there that we can focus on. It's the Section 8, 9, and 10, and it's the do's for Congress in 8, it's the don'ts for Congress in 9, and then it's the don'ts for the states in 10. And that actually confused me for a little bit when I started looking at it. And, and I'll be honest with you, I used to be confused by the Tenth Amendment. I know, don't, don't, don't admit that, right? But I was, I, I, I'm not a grammar guy. I'm a math guy, all right? So grammar confused me. Take a look at the Tenth Amendment with me just for a second. This was always, this, this language threw me for a loop. Part of it was very obvious. But I also think the Tenth Amendment is the best place to describe enumerated powers. And if you'll forgive my examples again, I'm going to go back to the buckets. Uh, page 42 in the Constitution, in the original language, and page 43 in the Constitution made easy. These buckets of power that the Constitution sets up, okay, the Tenth Amendment describes the three buckets. We have one bucket that are the powers that we the people have loaned to the federal government. Now that bucket, friends, it has a lid on it. Congress cannot add power to itself. It only comes from us. So we created power for the federal government and we put a lid on it. We put specific enumerated powers in there. And then the Tenth Amendment describes the other two buckets. Here's what they are. So first you have your bucket where we've get, you know, loaned power to government. It says the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution. So it's referring first to those powers delegated to the federal government by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectfully or to the people. So we have the bucket for the federal government those prohibited by it to the states, and then those reserved to the people or, or the states. It's that middle phrase that confused me. Okay, I know it probably makes perfect sense to everybody else in the country, but for me, nor prohibited by it to the states? Huh? <laughs> what does nor prohibited by it to the states mean? If they had said nor prohibited by the Constitution to the states, I might have understood, but here's where I finally figured it out. When I went and looked at Section 10, Article 1, Section 10, the don'ts for Congress, and it went... Ding, 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 I get it. Okay, so the, in the Tenth Amendment, when it talked about things being prohibited for the states, that's what Article 1, Section 10 is. Some don'ts for Congress, I mean for the states. Some things that we're going to take away from the states. And, and if you think about it, some of these just make sense. You don't want the states negotiating treaties with foreign nations. You've got 50 different treaties with foreign nations. We want only the federal government to do that. So there's a list of things in Article 1, Section 10 the states are no longer allowed to do. And so we have our bucket of powers given to the federal government, our bucket of powers taken away from the states, nor prohibited by it to the states. That's that bucket. And that's, of course, things that will be in the bucket for the federal government. Everything else, it says, are reserved to the states respectfully or to the people. So if we didn't give that power to the government through our Constitution, through our representatives, if we didn't take it away from the states, man, everything else is ours. Everything else is left to the people and to the states. And that means that that lid is supposed to be secure and tight. And the only way you open that lid and put a new power in Congress's bucket is if we amend this document. Article 5 is the only way to do it. That's why the 18th Amendment opened the lid, put a new power in, and then later with the 21st, we cracked that lid open, pulled some of that back, and then closed the lid again. Our problem today is that Congress has opened the lid on its own and is adding all kinds of powers and new departments and everything else that's not in Article 1, Section 8. And we, we the people are the ones that are going to have to put that lid back on. I would suggest taking some of those powers back before putting the lid on. But it's our job to get them back in their, in their proper place. And so that's why we're going to look at what they're supposed to be doing. Article 1, Section 8. These are the enumerated powers of Congress. If it's not in here, 
they're not supposed to be doing it. If it's not in here, it's unconstitutional for them to be doing it. We have unconstitutional powers being executed by our federal government right now. They were never given the authority in the first place to do it. So we've got to rein them in. The only way we can rein them in is if we know what the proper powers are first. So let's look in that bucket and see what those powers are. 18 enumerated powers that the federal government has. First and right off the bat, as much as I don't like it, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes. <laughs> All right, so they can. And of course, you've got to have the ability to do that. They can lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excesses. Why? To pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Now, here's a fundamental question. What does Congress have the power to tax for? What do they have the power to spend money on? This question was debated early by these guys, obviously, when they did the Constitution, and even within the first few decades, when people tr start, tried to start opening that lid and adding some powers for the federal government, others that had been part of the debate said, whoa, time out, I was there. You're not supposed to do that unless you amend the Constitution. So let's take a look at this phrase we already mentioned, general welfare. Now, general welfare today means I can pass anything in Congress I want because I'm helping the general welfare. I'm providing for the welfare of the people. And that tends to be the actions coming out of Washington, D.C. What did these guys say it was supposed to mean? Take a look there on your screen. When you look at the language in Article 1, Section 8, general welfare does not just suddenly appear by itself. There, there, there's no individual sentence that says, oh, Federal Congress does anything that's for the general welfare of the people. It's in the context of this longer phrase that says what? to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Interesting to me, when I started reading the debates of what they actually said and did here, when I started reading their commentaries, let's take Madison for instance. I mean, James Madison is the father of the Constitution. If there's an expert that can tell us what happened in this room, Madison's probably the best guy. Now, Governor Moore spoke more at the convention. James Wilson spoke the second most, Morris 173 times. Uh, um, Wilson 168 times. So, I mean, they were very influential over the document. But Madison, I think, has earned that, that place of being the father of the Constitution, the guy that everybody goes to as the expert. Madison tells us that during all those debates, general welfare wasn't even discussed until at the very end. It was a non-issue. It was in the Articles of Confederation talking about the states, the general welfare of the states. And throughout the convention, they ignored it. In fact, they'd ignored something else throughout the convention. They hadn't talked about the debts of the Confederacy and how they were going to deal with that. And so right at the end, in a conversation dealing with the debts and how you pay for the debts, the phrase general welfare got inserted into this sentence. And here's where the, the conversation was going. They were saying, look, what's a proper tax for the federal government? What's well, well, a proper thing to spend money on? Well, obviously, if you go to war, you got to pay for that war. And it's the job of the nation, the federal government, to protect the system, the general welfare of the system, by fighting any foreign enemy. And almost always when you fight a war, you're going to run up some debt, right? You're, you're going to have to borrow money to fight that war. And so what these guys said was if you did that and you ran up a debt, then as soon as that war was over, you should cut, tighten the belt, do whatever it takes to pay that debt off. And so many of the guys that sat in this room, either for the Constitution or the Declaration, gave us great quotes about the fact that if you carry debt over to the next generation, it's theft that you're stealing from the next generation. If you borrow more in your generation than you can pay off, you, you, you have stolen from your children and your grandchildren. So get that stuff paid off. And so in the context of that mindset, these guys said, it's a proper function of the federal government to defend the nation, and then it's a proper function of the federal government to have taxes that they can raise the money to pay off those debts that were necessary to defend the nation. That was the context of this phrase. I find it quite interesting that that they wanted you to be able to raise taxes to pay the debts so that you could protect the general welfare. And today, we run up the taxes and run up the debt to supposedly take care of the general welfare. We're really taking care of individual welfare, not general welfare. We're destroying the general welfare for somebody's individual welfare. We're running up the taxes, and we're not even paying the debt. So we've got trillion-dollar debts that are hurting the general welfare instead of doing what these guys did. Now, here's the problem. We talked earlier about original intent and, and phraseology. Even Madison himself talking about the, uh, how, how if you change the phraseology or the meaning of the phraseology to modern times, that would change the Constitution itself. Here's a better description. Uh, 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 well, actually, let me give you Hamilton first. 
General welfare means different things to different people today. What we need to know is what did it mean to these guys? Because what they meant by it is the meaning the Constitution today should still have. And I actually should address this whole idea of the Constitution alive, all right? We want to bring the Constitution alive. That doesn't mean we believe in this living, breathing document theory that a lot of people have out there. That's really the two different views of the Constitution. You have guys like Souter on the court and others that say, oh, it's, it's a living, breathing document, which means it needs to change with the times and change with the people. And I have to change it because I'm on the Supreme Court. So if five of the nine justices on the Supreme Court decide to change something in the Constitution, well, it's alive and we can do that. No, no, no. Constitution alive means that this document is still alive. It is still applicable today to our lives. And if we don't like what's in here, we can amend it. I believe that these guys put a document in place and a system of freedom in place that stands the test of time. And when it needs to be tweaked, we do that through, through Article 5. But anyway, this, this idea of the Constitution being alive, us bringing it to life, is not the same as what some of the left-wing members of the court call the living Constitution. And just an idea for you to break down the court right now, you've got four justices that buy into this living, breathing document, whatever we want it to be, we can make it. And you've got four justices that are strict constructionists, originalists, uh, what, this, what I believe in, saying you, you judge it based on what these guys said, not what the court today says. And then, of course, there's Justice Kennedy in the middle, which means virtually every decision depends upon what Justice Kennedy had for breakfast that day. And however he feels, that's what the decision ends up being. He's the deciding vote almost every time. But anyway, so that's kind of the, the theories out there. But back to what Madison said, uh, Hamilton said about general welfare, because we want to judge general welfare based on these guys, not what our congressman says today or what the court might say today or what some professor says or what I say. It's what these guys said that matters. So here's what Hamilton said about general welfare. He said, the welfare of the community of states is the only legitimate end for which money can be raised from the community. So if you go back to the phrase that we were just reading, let's jump back over there to Article 1, Section 8, page 12 and 13. So 13 if you're looking at the Constitution Made Easy, 12 if you're looking at the original. So to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. So he's saying the only thing that the federal government can raise money for is for a general purpose. So here's what he goes on to say. So if it's going to be raised from the community, the only legitimate end for which money can be raised from the community, Congress can be considered as only under one restriction, which does not apply to other governments. They cannot rightfully apply the money they raise to any purpose merely or purely local. The constitutional test of a right application must always be whether it's for a purpose of general, meaning this is for the whole system, or local nature. So if Congress spends money that's for the whole system, then he's saying, even Hamilton, who later becomes kind of the, the, the liberal, if you will, of the founding fathers as he tries to expand the power of Congress, he's saying that, that when they raise money, it, it, uh, the only proper function would be for a general purpose for everybody, not for a local purpose. So the bridge to nowhere or, you know, a, a general purpose would be the interstate system for the nation to allow the free flow of commerce. That you can make an argument for is a general purpose. But for a bridge to 24 people that costs however many hundreds of millions of dollars that thing costs, obviously that's a local nature. And Hamilton would say that's not a proper use of this phrase, general welfare. Here's Madison's description. I love this. It's brought it so into focus for me to understand the difference between general welfare, the way people define it today, and general welfare, the way the guys that sat in this room, the way they defined it. Here's Madison. He said, consider for a moment the immeasurable difference between the Constitution limited in its powers. Now, that's, that's what they did, the bucket with the lid on it, if you will. Constitution limited in its powers to the enumerated objects and expounded, or if you would, or expounded, as it would be by the import claim for the phraseology in question. Now, the letter he's writing here is in a debate over the question of general welfare. And he's saying... If you define it as the bucket with the lid on it, if you define it the way these guys define it, as limited in its powers to the uh, enumerated objects, or expounded as it would be, as they wanted general welfare to mean, he said, man, the difference, he probably didn't say man, <laughs> I don't think that Madison talked like that, but anyway, the difference is equivalent to two constitutions. So we have two totally different things here, of characters essentially contrasted with each other, the one possessing powers confined to certain specific areas or cases, the bucket with the lid on it, the other extended to all cases whatsoever. That's two totally different constitutions. And then he asked the question of whether or not these guys in this room would have ever gone for this expanded to any cases whatsoever. Look at how he puts it. He said, can less be said than that it is impossible 
that such a constitution as the latter, this expanded to be anything, would have been recommended to the states by all the members of that body whose names were subscribed to the instrument, the men that sat in this room in 1787. He's saying it is impossible that these guys would have signed that constitution, and he would know he was here. He was one of them. Is it credible that such a power would have been unnoticed and unopposed in the federal convention, this is the constitutional convention that took place here? And then he takes it even further than that. Not only would these guys have never gone for this expanded government into anything, not only were these guys adamant about the bucket having a lid on it, he goes back home to the states for the ratification. Listen to this. In the state conventions, which contended for and proposed restrictive and explanatory amendments, now, and he's talking, of course, about the Bill of Rights, right? Because those state conventions are where all those ideas emanated from. They debated them and they talked about them, those great debates between Madison and Patrick Henry and Virginia and all the other debates. He said even in those state conventions where, where they came up with the amendments that would ultimately go into the Constitution, he's saying those guys would have never dreamed general welfare would mean what people want it to mean today. And then he said in the Congress of 1789. So think about the progression here. You got what happened in this room, okay, so we got the Constitutional Convention itself. He said, never, no way would those guys have gone for general welfare. They wanted enumerated, limited powers, lid on the bucket. Congress, uh, uh, I mean the state conventions that ratified what happened in here, at all those state conventions, they would have never gone for general welfare, meaning that they wanted the lid on the bucket. And then in Congress, the first Congress in 1789 that adopts the 10 amendments that came from those states, they would have never gone for general welfare. He's saying in all three cases, he says a power to impose unlimited taxes for unlimited purposes could never have escaped those public bodies. All three of them, this room and the others as well. Now listen to his summation because I think it's great. He says the Constitution is a limited one, possessing no power not actually given. Now even a country boy from Dripping Springs can understand that. No power not actually given. There is no power in the Constitution that is not actually given. So the bucket, we gave them these powers, we put a lid on it, we cannot let them add power to that. Why? Why did those guys sit in this room and for months debate the smallest thing? I mean, look, they listed every little thing they wanted the federal government. Turn the page there and look at that. Post offices and post roads, they even took the time to list that they could build roads. Now, friends, it was the middle of the summer. In Philadelphia, it was hot. Man, they had the windows shut off, the doors closed, didn't want anybody listening to what they were doing. They were wearing those, you know, 15 layers of clothes they wore back then. These guys were sweating it out, let me tell you. And here they are in that heat, sweating it out, and they're willing to take the time to list every little thing that Congress could do. Why? Why would they do that? I'm asking, why would they do that? Limited government and a distrust. What's the rest of that quote say? carrying on the face of it a distrust of power. These guys didn't trust power any more than you and I do. They understood the nature of man, the depravity of man, that if you give power to somebody, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is evil, no man can know it. These guys said that's why they wanted separation of power, because the heart is evil, no man can know it. So we didn't want to put too much power in anybody's hands. And in fact, we wanted to define very carefully what that power was and put every little thing in writing, everything in the bucket, is in writing right here. That's why they did it for us, friends. Enumerated powers, we've lost that concept in America. We've got to teach the rising generation to be free, and the way we do that is we give them the details. We show them exactly what the Constitution gave the federal government the power to do. Now, we're not going to have time to go through every one of those powers, but there's a couple of examples I want to run through here. Now, general welfare, by the way, have you noticed that's kind of become a loophole? That's become a loophole so big you can drive a Mack truck through it. I mean, that has become a phrase you hear over and over and over again from, from members of Congress, that they have the power to do something because of general welfare. Well, you, you know, there's some other loopholes. What would, you, what would you guess out of the Constitution are some other phrases that have become loopholes for the federal government to get around those limits? What, what, would, what would you say is necessary and, proper. necessary and proper clause? Exactly right. One more. What's, what's another big one? Public good. Public good, absolutely. Then there's one that actually, that, that health care, they tried to cram health care through. What's that one? Interstate trade. Interstate trade, but we call it the Commerce Clause. Now let's say it all together. Commerce Clause. That's right. Okay, so, so the Commerce Clause is enough. So you got, you got necessary and proper clause uh, for good, the general welfare, the Commerce Clause. I mean, these have become loopholes that they, they shove anything into instead of sticking with the bucket. So the best way for us as citizens to close the loophole 
is to go back to those words in the Constitution and say, well, what did they really mean? We already did general welfare. What did they mean by commerce clause? What did they mean by necessary and proper? What did those things really mean? Let's look at commerce, and, and I'm going to skip over, well, I won't skip over. This next clause there, if, you look, if you're on page 12 where we're going through the enumerated powers, I know we don't like it. I don't like these trillion dollars deficits, friends. I think they're immoral. I think they're wrong. Unfortunately, they are constitutional. And that phrase says, to borrow money on the credit of the United States. They have, it's one of the powers we put in the bucket. And of course, we want them to be able to fight wars. At some time, you might have to, you know how close we were to amending that part of the Constitution? We almost had a balanced budget amendment, 1999. Anybody know? How close were we? One. You got it right there, ma'am. One vote. One vote. We could have had it with one more vote. Don't tell me your vote doesn't count. Every vote counts every single time. I think we've got a good, lot of momentum in the country right now. That's probably an amendment we can get done if we put enough support behind it. But anyway, it is obviously constitutional for them to borrow money right now. Let's rein that one in. But here's the Commerce Clause, okay? So here's, here's this next big loophole that they run through. I see three areas right here that, that the federal government has the power, we gave them or loaned them the power to regulate three areas of commerce. Now regulate does not mean micromanage. Back then it meant to make regular. So it doesn't mean they get to micromanage it, it means they actually get to make it regular, which is back to this idea of general welfare. It's back to the idea of protecting the system itself. And in commerce, what's the system you want to protect? The free flow of free enterprise, right? So in order to do that, we gave them the power to be the negotiators, if you will, in these three areas of commerce. Three areas only. Number one, we said they can regulate commerce with foreign nations. We already mentioned we don't want 50 states negotiating with, with these uh, countries and having 50 different treaties. So we let the federal government do that. Fair enough. Second category, and among the several states, as, as Thomas said, that's interstate commerce. So that interstate commerce that crosses a state line, you could say that the federal camel nose is under the tent. We gave them, loaned them, I'm sorry, loaned them the power to in some way make regular commerce across state lines. Now that doesn't mean micromanage. What it means is we're not going to let one state abuse another state in terms of free enterprise. For instance, in Texas, we've, we've really over the last few decades um, increased our agriculture in the area of, of vineyards and, 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 uh, and uh, um, having uh, wineries all around Texas. And, and it's actually become a big part of our, our agriculture. Well, California, obviously huge in that, right? Well, Texas legislature cannot pass a law that says, well, we really want to help these guys with these vineyards in Texas be able to do better in their sales so Texans can't buy California wine anymore. We're going to impose a, a blockade. <laughs> That's why we want a commerce clause in the Constitution so that the federal government can say to Texas, no, you can't do that. We want the free flow of commerce because we believe in the free market. And we believe that if you allow, allow that free market to flow, everybody's going to be better off. So that's a legitimate function of the federal government. And then the last category with the Indian tribes. So you've got sovereign uh, Indian tribes. You ought to have the nation uh, of the United States negotiating with them and not all these individual states in terms of the commerce. So there's your three categories, foreign nations, uh, interstate commerce, and your Indian tribes. So I'm just curious, why is it? If I'm going to put a new bathroom in my house, let's say I'm going to do a little remodeling. I'm going to add a new bathroom, I'm going to remodel a bathroom. If I call up Joe the plumber up there in Ohio and I say, hey Joe, would you come in and do my bathroom for me? He says, yes, he's going to come. So he's going to bring in tools. He's going to bring in some guys. I got some interstate commerce going on now, right? So the feds actually have an, a, a, an opportunity to make regular this transaction. What if my wife says, you know, honey, I was looking online and they've got this beautiful, fancy, you know, foo-foo toilet in France that I want to order. It's only $1,200, baby. I, you know, I'm, I'm, and she's going to order this thing. from now, now the federal government's got an international, right? We've got a foreign nation involved. So now they can make regular the transaction of my remodel in my house. So they got two opportunities. There. What happens? If Joe the plumber calls me and said, Rick, man, I got 15 tea parties I'm speaking at this month. There ain't no way I can get down there to do your bathroom. You're going to have to find somebody local. So I can't get Joe the plumber from Ohio. So I hired Joe Smith down the road in Dripping Springs, Texas. He's going to come do it. No tools coming in from out of state. No labor coming in from out of state. We don't have interstate commerce going on anymore. My wonderful, brilliant, gorgeous, amazing wife, as always happens, makes a brilliant decision. It says, you know, honey, that'd be really Foolish of us to buy that $1,200 toilet from France when Lowe's has one for $79, it's going to work just fine. So being as brilliant as she is, she decides we're going to do that. We don't have France involved anymore. No more international commerce, right? No more foreign nations involved. 
So we don't have foreign nations. We don't have interstate commerce. Why is it that the federal government gets to tell me how much water's got to go through my toilet? What kind of light bulbs I got to have in my bathroom? How wide my door's got to be? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. It must be because Joe Smith there next door is Choctaw. <laughs> or because, thank you, somebody got that one. <laughs> or because I'm part Comanche. I, I'm assuming because of me having some Comanche blood that the federal government has decided that my, any transaction is with an Indian trust. Surely that, I can't figure it out because there is no reason for the federal government to have anything to do with the commerce that is not fitting into any of those three categories. And you know what's really sad? The courts got this right for a long time. They slapped Congress down, slapped their hand for years when they would try to expand, open up the lid, get a new power, expand and do commerce that was not in those three categories. And then all of a sudden, they started kind of rubber stamping what would come out of Congress. And you remember why. It was, it was FDR. He, he had the, you know, the switch in time that saved nine, and he was going to pack the court and all this stuff. Was, and, and all of a sudden, they decided, well, you know, we said a little while ago, minimum wage, you couldn't do that because that doesn't fit into the Commerce Clause. But now we're going to let you do that. And then they started letting them regulate this and regulate that. And, re and now, you know how bad it's gotten. The, it's gotten so bad, the, 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 the Wickard v. Filburn case, this is where a guy is farming, he is raising his own crops. He is not selling them to anybody. He's consuming them himself. He's not buying them from anybody. So there's no commerce here, right? I mean, this would be like you having a garden in your backyard. He's not buying, no commerce. Our court said the federal government could come in with all the way to the Department of Agriculture on this guy and say, you have to obey all of our, we can regulate everything you're doing because it's commerce. You say, well, how is it commerce? that's not crossing state lines? How's it commerce if he's not even selling anything and he's not buying anything? They say, well, you know, had he bought those crops down at the farmer's market, it might have affected the price of commerce. I mean, the price of those, uh, those, those crops. Had he sold his crops at, down at the farmer's market, it might have affected the price, and therefore this is somehow going to have some, uh, you know, some related, if you connect enough dots, it will impact interstate commerce. Friends, that's where we are. That's how far we've gone from the plain language, I mean, is anybody confused by those three categories? Anybody confused by the plain language of the Constitution? And yet, because we've gone away from what these guys told us to do, we no longer interpret that language by what they said. We let some judge somewhere else twist it a little bit, then twist it a little more, then twist it a little more. You know how bad it is now? The whole idea of, of, of taking health care through the Commerce Clause the federal judge that initially said it was unconstitutional, he said the reason is because not only did Wickard v. Filburn allow us to regulate commerce or, or regulate activity that was not commerce, not only did it go so far as to allow us to regulate activity that was not commerce, what this law does is it allows us to regulate inactivity that is not commerce. And do you get how bad that is? That means we can regulate anything you do or don't do. And that's what the court said was such a bad idea. And, and by the way, one good thing that came out of the um, Supreme Court decision on health care is that Justice Roberts actually said no to using the Commerce Clause for health care. So he put the brakes on this slippery slope we've gone with the Commerce Clause. That was one of the good things that came out of it. In fact, he said, the path of our Commerce Clause decisions has not always run smooth, but it is now well established that Congress has broad authority under the clause. Hang on a second. Well established by whom? Is there a retired English teacher in the room? Is it whom or who? Well established by, let's just go with whom because it makes it sound smart. I don't know. Well established by whom? I mean, just because the courts have said that the Commerce Clause gives broad discretion to Congress, that doesn't mean it's so. That doesn't mean that's what these guys wanted. And when you go back to what they said, they did not want it to give them broad discretion. So I completely disagree with the Chief Justice on this. It is not well established. It may be <laughs> well, you know, thought in their minds or well established in their circles, but not these guys that sat in this room. They'd be standing up and saying, oh, no, you got that one entirely wrong. In fact, the other four, the, the four justices that dissented in the health care decision said this about how far this was going to go if we allowed this kind of expansion of the government. This is Scalia, Alito, Thomas, and Kennedy. Thomas. To go beyond that, meaning going beyond what happened in Wickard v. Filburn, to go beyond regulating commerce activity that is not commerce under the Constitution, but to even go even further than that, they said, 
and to say that the failure to grow wheat. So remember what was happening in the case. This guy was growing wheat and consuming it. So there was an activity happening and the feds decided that that was an activity they could regulate. What they're saying is now we're going to go beyond even that and say that the failure that the failure to grow wheat. So now we're not growing wheat. And the failure to grow wheat, which is not an economic activity or any activity at all, nonetheless affects commerce. So now this guy doesn't even grow his wheat, doesn't sell it down the street, and so now we're going to be able to regulate him. They said that is to make mere breathing in and out the basis for federal prescription. It extends federal power to virtually all human activity. That's four of our Supreme Court justices saying this has gone way too far. We're using the Commerce Clause or frankly any part of the Constitution to regulate people just for breathing in and out. That's their words. That's how far we've allowed it to go, friends. Now, commerce is supposed to be free enterprise. The more we micromanage it, the less freedom we have. The more we force people into the marketplace, the less freedom we have. And Jefferson had a great quote on this. He said, the pillars of our prosperity are the most thriving when left most free to individual enterprise. When we regulate to the point of micromanaging, when we force people into the marketplace, we're not left free to individual enterprise, are we? That's how far we've gone. And the reason? We hadn't been reading it. We haven't studied it. We haven't looked at what the real meaning behind those words actually are. That's why what we're doing is so important. Because see, if, if you and I can go back to what these guys actually did and said, if we can learn what they really intended, and then we can go back home and we can share it with our friends and family, if we can use this knowledge in the decisions we make about who we elect to go to Congress, if we can begin to get young people to understand this and someday run for Congress, then we can get members of Congress that understand these things and we can rein this thing in. We can turn it back, folks. We can get Congress back into its proper bucket, if you will, with the lid on it. We'll just do our duties as citizens. Constitution alive means that this document is still alive. It is still applicable today to our lives. Well, David, I, I believe we can get to those big changes, yeah. but the, you know, and they will restore our constitutional republic if we bring them in. But to get to those, we have to dive into the details. And it makes me think about why the founders got so detailed. I mean, for them to sit in that hot room and sweat it out and actually go through line by line, like you said earlier, post office, I mean, post roads and all these specific details. Why did they do that? Why not just have one general statement that said government can do whatever's necessary to protect us? They had a real distrust of power. They had been through it themselves with the king, but they've also been through it in the scriptures. And John Adams, for example, is one that in multiple letters talks about Jeremiah 17, 9 as the basis for why they separated powers because the scripture says the heart of man is desperately wicked who can know it. In other words, if you leave man to his own devices, it will turn bad. He so they distrusted government power. because they distrusted man. They distrusted man. Mm -hmm. And so man is not naturally good. You have to corral him and get him to do the right things. Um, it, it's kind of funny. Who teaches two-year-olds to lie? And it just comes natural. You, <laughs> you know? don't have to. Who do you? I mean, there's 43 toys in a room, and and the kid can have any one. But if his sister picks up that one, that's, that's the, the one. one that, uh, who taught yeah, him? You yeah. know, who taught him selfishness? Yeah. That's just part nature of human man. nature. Yeah. And, and so they understood the nature of man. That look, there there are ways you can learn self-control, but there are other times you have to exert control because they've seen all the stuff that happened in France. They've seen Robespierre and all the stuff that went with that. They've seen the revolution in Greece. They've seen all these revolutions. And they've been under British history themselves, watching what's happened with the different kings, whether it was William and Mary or whether it was Mary, Queen of Scots, totally different approaches. So they knew history. They knew the character of man. And as John Adams said, they knew the Bible. Therefore, we separate powers and we're really specific. We're not going to just tell you general categories. We're going to tell you what you can do. And the other reason is, you remember we were talking earlier about battle plans and battle maps. Yeah. You get up there. Yeah, looking at the bird's 30, eye view, you really getting, yeah. All right, so we're up here, and we understand that we also are creating a federal republic which shares power with lower-level entities, and that's the state and, and communities. And so just as we have to separate power horizontally, we separate between the judiciary and the executive, and we separate it over here with the legislative. And by the way, not only did they separate powers, uh, the Federalist Papers said that they gave each branch constitutional arms of self-defense. In other words, if that branch starts doing something you're supposed you to be doing, you can fight back. You've got you've some got, tools in your toolbox. Now, I, I will just about guarantee you, you ask a congressman today, name me five tools you have to fight back against the judiciary, and they can't tell me a thing. 
but the, the Constitution gave each branch tools to fight back. N name me five tools you have against an overreaching executive. Name me five, whatever it is. Yeah. The other branches don't know that anymore. And so the founders were very specific. What a waste, because it really is a brilliant battle oh, plan that the founders put it in is. place to keep these And they wrote it all down. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I'm sure if they were here today, they say, are you just all illiterate? Why aren't you using what we are, gave you? Are you yeah. lazy? Yeah. I mean, I mean this, this room is filled with their writings yeah. and their own line, by the way. I mean, this these things you can get wasn't a secret meeting there. that they didn't that expose all the secrets. You know, they, they well, gave us all the secrets. Here it is. Uh, you know, all the, all the discussions in yeah. the Constitutional Convention, they're right here. And those were private discussions at the time, so they could be very candid, but right. they made them public But then public they came out and said, here's what we've got here's, for you. And, and, and here's a lot. So it. It, it's, it's real simple stuff. But what happens is we also have a separation of powers, not between the three branches, but between the levels of government. And that's federalism. Yeah. Hey, federal government, there's only certain things you can do. And by the way, state governments, here's what you can do. And local governments, here's what you do. And so that bicameralism of, of horizontal separation and, and branches and then the vertical separation powers that Thomas Jefferson talks about are very significant. So what they did, understanding all the components that, that have some jurisdiction in this, they said, okay, we're going to tell you specifically what Congress can do, what the president can do, and what the judicial branch can do. Yeah. Now, does that mean that there's not other stuff to be done? No, there definitely is. But that's why we give you the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. And the Tenth Amendment says anything we didn't specifically give to Congress belongs to the states. We gave 18 areas to Congress. That means 4,432,000 areas belong to the states. That's part of the vertical separation of powers. People, they look at that and say, well, they didn't say we couldn't do it. Yeah, they did. The Tenth Amendment said if we didn't tell the government That's they right. could do it, then they can't. So the Ninth and the Tenth Amendment, same with the people. You know, we told the government what they could do, but people, you got everything else that, that you can do. Yeah. So that's why they were very specific in what they did. That's why they gave us constitutional tools of self-defense. But the problem we have is if you are looking for a loophole, and, and you talked about the loopholes, the, yeah. the General Welfare Clause and the Commerce, and all, you will find a way to bust the intent of what it is. I don't care what the intent is. I want a loophole so that I can get around it. Yeah. And, you, and you'll change the meaning of words, do whatever change, it takes right. to get around it. Yeah. And, John Dickinson, who was not only a guy who helped put the Declaration together, but he's the guy who also signed the Constitution, one of, one of the founding fathers, he, he talked about how dangerous that is when you start looking for loopholes and how it changes everything. And, and I'll just read here from, from his work. He says, Nothing is more certain than that the forms of liberty may be retained when the substance is gone. Mm -hmm. In other words, you still got a Constitution, but it doesn't work anymore because you, you've you had a heart transplant. You took the heart out of it and placed it with something else. He said, nothing is more certain than that the forms of liberty may be retained when the substance is gone. He said, in government as well as in religion, and then he makes a direct quote, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, that's a direct quote out of 2 Corinthians 3, 6, and he notes it's right out of the Bible. He says that works in government just like it is in religion. If you forget, for example, that in religion, Jesus, in dealing with the Sabbath law, said, hey, guys, don't forget the Sabbath was made to serve you. You weren't made to serve the Sabbath. Well, you can get so into Sabbath laws that it becomes a bondage on your back. And instead yeah. of you getting the rest you need, it becomes something that's your slave driver. He said government's the same way. Because you've gotten caught up in the legalistic kind of letter right. of the law instead of the spirit of that's right. what he intended. And, and, and so, same thing. If you get caught up in the actual wording of the General Welfare Clause, and if I tweak my nose just the right direction, if I tilt my shoulder Stand a little, just right. I, 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 can, I can find an interpretation. No. The general, remember the spirit of the general welfare clause. Which you get by studying all this. Which by, you get by, by studying getting all their that. Heads and and which you laid out intended. very clearly. Yeah. I mean, the found, you, you had all the founders' quotes on it. Don't, don't try to squeeze a new meaning out of this, but go to the, because when you do, he says, in, in government as well as religion, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And if you go to that literal word by word interpretation instead of what they were trying to give, you will kill the Constitution, you'll kill the country, you'll kill freedom, you'll kill prosperity, you'll kill all those things we enjoy. And that's why the founders are so good about being so specific in so many areas so that we can get the principles, apply the principles, and have the same result that we've had for 200 years. All right, we're going to keep walking through those specifics. The great thing here is we're getting some tangibles. I mean, these, mm -hmm. are, these are real areas where you can restore that liberty if you go back to that original meaning. It's kind of neat. It's not just this, oh, study the Constitution. We're finding specific areas. We go, oh, we can fix that that's area right, right that's there, right. now that we know the, what the intent was, we go to our congressman and say, hey, let's get this thing right. So we're going to get into more of those specifics. Our hope, our hope is that you are getting excited and realizing that we can restore right. this constitutional republic. In our next chapter, we'll finish out Article 1, Section 8, and those enumerated powers. And we're going to take some questions from our audience in Philadelphia when we come back on Constitutional Live with David Barton and Rick Green.